alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I said yesterday I was done. But they said you guys wanted me back. So I'm back. Alhamdulillah. Give the people what they want. What I have to say today, hopefully, insha'Allah ta'ala will comfort you. Because that's really been the theme of this conference is reviving the love of deen in the hearts of the mu'mineen. There's something that every single Muslim struggles with. And there's something that every single human being struggles with. And if we don't understand how to deal with it, it causes problems in our lives. And this is the age-old question of how to deal with this problem. But before I deal with this problem, I need to make sure that we have this problem for me to deal with. So let me ask you a question, as I always start my lectures with questions. I told you, I'm a psychologist at heart. So questions open the mind. I don't need to know how many or how great or what have you, but raise your hand if you have ever made a mistake or committed any sin in your life. Hands down. So I think, I, I think I'm on target with this one, insha'Allah ta'ala. Guess what? It wasn't your first sin, was it? Won't be your last, will it? No. We know this. The Prophet والسلام, said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every son of Adam sins. Every son of Adam sins. This is reality. But why? Why do we sin? I mean, why, why, why do we make mistakes? Why is it that no matter how hard we try, no matter how high our iman goes, no matter how much we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much Quran you've memorized, how pious you may think you are, you're going to sin. Why? And what do we do about it? How do we fix it? Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for what reason? For what reason? Ibadah, to worship Him. Is sin worshiping Allah? So why do we do it? Why do we do it? Why does every single human being sin? And how do we fix it? I'm going to tell you. When I understood this concept, it made me realize the true value of who I was. When I was good and when I was bad. Realized it. The way we figure out why we sin and the process of solving it and the whole mystery behind it, we have to go back as far in human history as can go. As far back in human history as we can go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala azza wa jal, jala wa ala, tells us a story very early in the Quran, in Surah Al Baqarah. Very early. Allah tells us a story. And this is the story of the very first human being. The first of us, where we all trace our lineage. I don't care where you're from today. I don't care what language you speak today. I don't care what color you are today. We trace all of our lineages back to the very first human being, Adam alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before creating Adam, before creating Adam, he had a conversation with the angels who were near to him. And he said to them, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. Verily, I am going to place on earth a khalifa, a vicegerent, something special. And the angels understood a few things. Number one, they understood by the word khalifa that this is something very honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This thing that Allah was about to create and place on earth is something special. Something different than anything Allah has created so far. But they also understood the implications of this Khalifa. Because before we existed, Allah had already created another race known as the jinn. And He also gave them a free will to do whatever they wanted to do with their lives. And what happened? They made mischief. They caused havoc. So the angels asked Allah Azza wa a very logical question. They said, Our Lord, are you going to place on it one who will cause mischief and shed blood? 
Are you going to place on earth this Khalifa who's going to cause mischief? He's going to shed blood. His progeny is going to shed blood. Are you going to do that? While we celebrate your praises day and night. You see, what they were asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is was that if, if, if you desire to be worshipped more, we do that and we don't fail. We never stop worshipping you. We have no choice. So why are you going to place on earth someone who's going to cause mischief and shed blood? Now, did the angels know us or did they know us? Were they right about us? They were very right. How long was it before the mischief and bloodshed began? Hmm? How long? The sons of this Khalifa, the son of this Khalifa is going to start it. Not even one generation is going to pass before it starts. And it's only going to get worse and get worse and get worse until we see a world today where all there is is mischief and bloodshed. Which the Prophet ﷺ predicted at the end of time there would be bloodshed upon bloodshed upon bloodshed. This is the world we live in today. So they were right. They knew what would happen if Allah created this Khalifa, placed him on earth and let them have their free reign. But Allah Azza wa Jal knew something else. He knew something. So what did he respond to the angels? What did he say to them? What did he say? Verily, I know what you don't know. You see, Allah didn't even explain himself and tell them the, the wisdom. He said just, I know what you don't know. I'm going to create him and his wife because I know something you don't know. I know something you don't know. And he created Adam alayhi salam and he taught him the names of all things. Because he wanted to prove why he made this Khalifa. Taught him the names of all things and told Adam, tell the angels, tell them all the names of these things. And then he asked them, do you know the names of these things? They said, oh Lord, we have no knowledge except that what you have given us. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had proven this Khalifa was what he said he was, he told everyone bow down. Everyone bow down to this Khalifa. Because he's special. He's special. And they all bow down. We know the story except for Iblis. Iblis couldn't understand it. Iblis was angry before even Adam was given a soul. Shaitan Iblis was already jealous. Look at this thing. It's made out of mud. There's nothing special about it. Why is this thing being so honored by Allah? So he refused. He said, I won't bow down to something you created from dirt. When you created me from fire. Arrogance. Arrogance. And we know what happened. Allah cast him out. And then Shaitan asked for respite. Shaitan asked for respite. He said, just allow me to prove to you that this Khalifa and his progeny are not what you think they are. Let me prove to you. I will come from the front, from the back, from the sides, and I will mislead them. And I will prove to you that you are wrong. You see, it's the arrogance of shaitan. I will show you. And so Allah said, go ahead. I'll give you respite to the day of judgment. And you'll be able to lead all of them astray. Except for my chosen slaves. You won't get them. So then Adam salam was created. And then Allah took from him his rib and created his wife, Hawaiiv, and then placed them in the garden. Placed them in the beautiful garden of bliss. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended for this Khalifa and his progeny to live. In this high status always. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave them some rules. He said, this entire garden, this entire place, everything your eyes can see, is halal for you. Enjoy all of it. Except this one tree. There is one tree I have placed in this garden that you are not allowed to touch. You see, there's no point in having a free will. People ask, why does evil exist? Why are all... There's no point in even having a free will if there's no choice between yes or no. If there's no choice between right and wrong, the free will makes no sense. It doesn't. We wouldn't even know right from wrong if the two didn't exist. We would know what is good and what is bad. We would be just like the angels because we would be left with no choice but to do the right thing. 
But then shaitan came to them, both of them, and he tricked them. He played games with them. You see, shaitan is very good at head games. He's been good at it since the beginning, and you think he's gotten worse? No, he's only gotten better. With practice, he's only gotten better at it. He's an expert at what he does, tricking us, confusing us, causing us to go astray. So he convinced Adam and Eve that they should eat from this tree, and they did. The one thing they weren't supposed to do, they only had one rule. We live in a world with so many rules now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so many things we can't do. They had one thing. They did it. They did it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to them and said, you can't be here anymore. You see, this place is for special people. Now you have to go and prove yourself worthy of this place. You got to go down. And you're going to have to toil, and you're going to have to struggle, and you're going to have to live and get old and get sick and die, and all of this, all of this is going to have to happen to you now. You have to get down from here. But you see, there was a conversation that took place between Adam السلام, and Allah at this time. That is a very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful conversation. You can find it recorded in uh, the, the tafsir of Ibn Kathir under these ayat. Many people didn't know about Ibn Kathir. Not only was he a great commentator on the Quran, he was also a muhaddith. He was also a man of the hadith sciences. Adam السلام, had a few questions that he wanted to put forward to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these questions become the understanding of who we are and why we commit sin and what is it all about. Adam السلام, asked Allah Azza wa Jal, My Lord, did you not create me with your own two hands? from the dirt of the ground. Did you not create me with your own two hands? And Allah said, yes. Yes, I did. He said, did you not blow into me the breath of life and cause me to live? And Allah said, yes. Yes, I did. Did not when I sneezed? You said, Allah. He said, yes, I did. Now here comes the beautiful question. <laughs> he said, did you not know when you placed me in that garden and you told me not to eat from that tree, didn't you already know I was going to eat from it? You see, this is the understanding of Adam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. So Allah already knew. Adam knew that Allah already knew when he placed him in that garden, when he told him not to eat from that tree, before Allah created anything, before that tree existed, before that garden existed, Allah already knew that Adam and Eve were going to eat from this tree. So Allah said, yeah, I knew you were going to do it. I knew you were going to do it. He said, so then can you not forgive me for it and place me back in that garden one day? And Allah said, yes. And then he taught him how. He said, you want to get back? This is how you do it. When you do things like what you just did, what, and this is being passed on now down through all of the progeny of Adam and is left for us in the Quran. When you do those things that you've done and you make the mistake and you commit the sin, then you turn to your Lord and you say, my Lord, I've wronged my own soul. I've committed dhulm on my own soul. I've harmed myself. Because you see, we can't harm Allah in the least. No matter how many sins you commit, no matter how many bad things you do, even if you decide not to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if people want to worship rocks, sticks, trees, and stones, they do no harm to Allah in the least. So you say, I've wronged my own soul. And if you do not forgive me, you see, this is the part of the yaqeen of this dua. If you do not forgive me and have mercy on me, surely I'm going to be a loser. See, this is what Allah taught them. Say this, and I can put you back here and I can forgive you for that. You see, life is not about whether you're going to make a mistake or not. The mistakes are guaranteed. The sins are guaranteed. You're going to sin. Every son of Adam sins. But the Prophet ﷺ also said, the best of those who sin are those who repent, are those who repent and make amends and they fix the problem. You see, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very beautiful relationship. It's a very beautiful relationship. And one of the most beautiful aspects of the ibadah between a human being and the Rabb is when they express need. When they express need. And there is no greater need the slaves of Allah can express towards him than the need of forgiveness. Because you can live without water for two weeks and die, and you can still go to Jannah. You can have a disease and die and still go to paradise. You can starve to death 
and maybe end up in the highest ranks of Jannah because of it. But without the forgiveness of Allah, as we talked about yesterday, without the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those doors will never open for you. You see, this is the most intimate part of the relationship between Allah and His slaves. When we mess up and we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in need of our Rabb, getting down on our hands and knees, telling our Lord, I've messed up, I've sinned. And I know for sure, there is no doubt in my mind that if you do not forgive me for this, if you don't have mercy on me for this, I will lose. I'll lose. You see, Allah loves this tawbah. Allah loves it. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves tawbah. He loves to forgive. You see, people have this misunderstanding, unfortunately, unfortunately. The non-Muslims have a misunderstanding that we worship a Lord who is angry all the time. That we worship a Lord who loves throwing people into hell. That we worship an angry God. And sadly, many of us have been taught the exact same thing. We've been taught to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than we've been taught to hope in Allah's mercy. You see, it's not wrong to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to fear Him so much that you lose hope in His forgiveness is a problem. It's a problem. Many of us, many of you, have been taught to fear Allah by the ul. You guys know the ul, right? You know the stick. Yeah, you've been taught to fear Allah by the stick or by the shoe or the wooden spoon or the belt. This is it. Fear Allah like this. If you don't do this, Allah is going to put you in hell. If you do that, Allah is going to put you in hell. I know because I've been to many Islamic schools. And I've spent time with many children. And I've done a survey on this. We've taught, we've taught our children to be so afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have some youth who have come to me thinking that they cannot be forgiven. And that breaks my heart. Because if you think that Allah cannot forgive you, then you don't know who you worship. You have no idea who you worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces himself in the Quran. And then every single chapter after it, except for Surah Al-Bara, with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires to forgive you. He desires to forgive you. There's a reason why you sin. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. I'm going to paraphrase many of these because I want to get through a few of them and don't be too long. He said, there was a man who committed a sin. And then he asked Allah to forgive him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Then this man committed another sin. And he said, my Lord, I've wronged my own soul. If you don't forgive me, have mercy on me, I will be a loser. And then Allah responded saying, my slave knows that he has a Lord who forgives sins. So I have forgiven him. Then he goes on and he sins again, the same thing happens. He sins again, the same thing happens. He sins again, the same thing happens. Finally, he sins and he says, My Lord, I have wronged my own soul. If you don't forgive me, I mercy me, I will be a loser. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says out to the angels, My slave has sure knowledge that he has a Rabb who will forgive sins and I have forgiven him. From this moment on, let him do as he wishes. You see, Allah didn't give him a free reign to sin. But he knew this one, when he sins, he's going to come back. He's going to come back, so I'm not worried about him. Let him do what he wishes. He'll come back. You see, this is the beauty of this deen. It's the beauty of this deen. That there's always an open door policy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to his forgiveness. Open door policy. We don't realize it. We all have angels that go with us everywhere we go. One of them writes our good deeds. As soon as you do a good deed, he writes it. It's down. In black and uh, in whatever it's written in, it's there and done. And then there's an angel who writes bad deeds. When you commit a sin, that angel withholds. He's told to withhold. Don't write it just yet. There is a grievance period that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded that angel just wait, wait. Why do you think he's supposed to wait? 
to see if you come back. To see if you come back. You see, this is how much Allah loves you. He's waiting for you to come back. And if you come back within that time period, then the angel doesn't even write it. Allah says, don't write it. It's as if it didn't happen. Don't, don't write it. It's, it's over. It's been forgiven. You see, this is the Rabb that we worship. This is the Lord that we worship. This is my ilah. This is who I worship. This is why I say, La ilaha illallah. Nobody, nobody has a Lord that they worship like this. And these people out here don't know that. They don't understand that. Because we don't understand that. We don't even grasp the concept. We don't even grasp it. That Allah's mercy encompasses everything. That He is more merciful than He is angry. That He desires mercy more than He desires retribution. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah is more merciful to His slaves than a mother is to her child. The companions were standing around the fire one day. And there was a child playing near it. And every time the child would get too close, the mother would grab it and pull it back. And the Prophet ﷺ began to cry. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, what makes you cry? They said, don't you see how much this mother loves her child? That she desires for it not to be burned by the fire? They said, yes. He said, know that Allah loves every single one of his slaves more than this. But yet they are persistent on jumping into it. You see, this is the Rabb that we worship. He doesn't care how many sins you've committed. He knew before creating you that he would do them. He knew before creating anything that existed that you would do it. It's not, that, that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not you are going to fix it. Whether or not you're going to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Him to forgive you. He's ready to forgive. You see, when Allah told the angels, I know something you don't know, this is what He was talking about. You see, because Allah could be known through many of His attributes. He could be known as powerful by what He has created and He upholds it. He could be known as al Khalid by His creation. He could be known many things, many attributes could be clearly known through what Allah has created. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to create a generation of people who would commit sins. And He knew they would commit sins. So that He could show true power in that He would forgive them even though He had the right to punish them. Because Allah has the right to punish every single one of us. It is His haq to punish us if we sin. It's His right. Because we have screwed up our purpose of living here. We could blame no one but us if Allah decided to punish us for every sin we committed. Who are we going to blame? Who are we going to blame? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows true power when He has the right to punish and yet He shows mercy. And we are always so worried about so many minuscule things. So many minuscule things. We cannot even forgive each other. We have families now that have been separated for years and years and years over the smallest misunderstanding. Brothers who won't talk to each other for some small grievance they had. Sisters who won't even salam each other because of some rumor that was spread around. I mean, look at us. Look how silly we look. And we have a Rabb who every single night, every single night without fail, descends into the lowest heaven. And he calls out, who is there to ask me to forgive their sins? I am here ready to forgive them. I mean, or who are we playing games with? Who are we fooling? We have let shaitan trick us into thinking it's hopeless because you sin, you're no good, you're nothing. We've had shaitan trick us in not being able to forgive each other. We've had shaitan trick us in not even being able to forgive ourselves. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's door of forgiveness is so wide, so wide. There will be a man, according to Msuma Hadith, I'll finish with a few things. There'll be a man who will be, on the day of judgment, his good deeds outweigh his bad deeds, so he needs to be punished. And he's being dragged towards Jahannam. He's being dragged by the angels to be thrown into Jahannam. As he approaches 
the edge of Jahannam, hell recedes back, steps away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who already knows, but the benefit for this dialogue is for you and I. Ask hell, what is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? Yeah, you have to think now, this slave's already been told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, needs to be burned, you need to pay for these sins. But hell is receding back and Allah is saying, what is the matter with you? And hell says, my Lord, he is seeking refuge with you from me. I had no choice. He's still seeking refuge with you from me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let my slave go. And he forgives him. And there's another man being dragged towards Jahannam. And he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Rabb, I didn't expect this from you. I didn't expect this. And Allah azza wa jal asked him, what did you expect? You committed the sins. You did this and that. I mean, what, what else did you expect? He said, I expected that your mercy was so great that it could even cover me. I expected that you were so merciful that it even would cover me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you will find Allah as you expect Him. You will find Allah as you expect Him. So Allah tells the, the angels, let him, drag him, let him go, let him go, let him go. You see, the doors to forgiveness are so many, so many, waiting for you every single day to walk through them. I don't care how many sins you have committed. I don't care how bad your past may be. Trust me. I have a bad past. There's parts of my story I leave out just because of the simple fact that Allah has already let it go. And I've let it go. No matter how many sins you might be doing right now. Maybe this conference is the first time you've attended anything Islamic in a long time. Maybe salah has been far from you for a very long time now. Maybe getting on your hands and knees and making dua to Allah is a distant memory in your life. Maybe. But let me tell you something right now. If you are still living, if you are still breathing, if your heart is still beating, there's hope. There's hope and there's forgiveness. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will forgive all sins except for shirk. Anything else? Allah says, I'll let it go. I'll let it go. You have to understand what the forgiveness of Allah means. The forgiveness of Allah means it's gone. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Now I'm going to give you one final last little story. And I'm done. This story is related very, very beautifully in a book by Ibn Al-Qaim Al-Jawziyah known as Majarij Salakin. It's the story about Jannah and our first days in Jannah. First and foremost, paradise is something that you can't imagine. Its ground is, smells like musk. The trees, their trunks are made out of gold and silver and their leaves are softer than silk. And the fruit that they produce is softer than butter and sweeter than honey. The roof of Jannah is the throne of Ar-Rahman. It's the roof of Jannah. Your houses are like houses that cannot be designed by the greatest architect that has ever lived in history. You will have tents outside of your houses that will look like beautiful pearls and they will be miles and miles and miles long. We will all enter into Jannah and we will be, you know, looking at our property, maybe looking at our husband and wife for a very long time. Because there's no time. Time just stops existing. And then a caller will call out all throughout Jannah. Ya Ahlu Jannah. O people of paradise, Allah has asked for you to come meet him. Allah has asked you to assemble. He wants to meet all of you. And so we will gather in this very big valley. And in this valley, there will be thrones that will sit up on high for the, for the most righteous of the righteous. And then there will be couches, and then there will be other garments laying out, and you'll be lined up according to your rank in paradise. Those of you who have made it to Firdos, front row seats. And as we're all sitting there wondering, you know, what is, what is going to happen? We're already in paradise. I mean, what, what's going on? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have his throne brought 
in front of all of us and he will come and he will say assalamu alaikum ya ahlu jannah peace be upon you o people of jannah and we will say allahumma anta assalam wa minka assalam oh allah you are peace and from you comes peace allah will say this day is the day that you were promised the day of increase this is the day that i promised you in the quran the day of increase Ask me today anything that you wish, and I will grant it to you. Well, I mean, what else could we want? We have Jannah, we have paradise. What, what could we possibly want? And we all ask the same thing. Ya Allah, let us see your face. We worshipped you for so long, and we never saw you. Now let us see you. That's the only thing we could hope for. It's the only thing we could want more. So see our Rabb. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lift his veil that prevents him from being seen. And a light will shine all throughout paradise that is so strong <clears throat> that if Allah had not willed, it would burn everything in creation. Nothing would exist because of it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let each and every one of us see his face. As Allah says in the Quran, there will be some of those days their face is bright gazing upon their Lord. And then Allah will call each and every one of us up to him, one by one, one by one. And he will start reminding us of our sins. Do you remember when you disobeyed me? Do you remember when you did this? Do you remember when you did that? Do you remember? You have to see what's happening here. Do you remember when you did that? And he reminds us of so many sins that we are afraid that we might be thrown out of Jannah. We might just get thrown out of here. I've done so much, I might, I might just be tossed right out. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Rabb, can you not forgive me for this? Can you not forgive me? And then Allah says to each and every single one of us, my slave, if I haven't already forgiven you, you wouldn't be here today. You see, this is what we're striving for. This is what we hope for. This is what we live for. This is what we work for. If you want it, if you want it, Fix your mistakes with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fix your relationship with Allah azza wa jal. Fix it today. Do not delay. Do not delay. The problems you have with people, let it go. Let it go. It's not that serious. Let it go. The problems you have with your families, let it go. It's not that serious. Because we all want to get to that point one day where we can look upon the face of Allah azza wa jal and we can have Allah tell us that he's pleased with us. That he is pleased with us and he has forgiven us for all the craziness we have done. And then after that, we won't ever worry again. لَتَحْزَنْ in اللَّهَ مَعَنَا Do not be afraid and don't be worried because Allah is surely with us and those who believe. وَجَزَكُرُ خَيْرًا وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ